Welcome back. This is Professor Emily Steele representing Motlow State Community College. Today we're going to jump into modern theater. Modern theater, um, which are two things kind of standing in harsh contrast, which is we'll talk about straight plays of the last uh, 100 years or so, and then we'll talk about my favorite thing and end um, on musical theater. So I've kind of held back my musical theater information because I know it's a split crowd. A lot of people either love musicals, they hate musicals, but we will end the course with me geeking out unashamedly. So let's get started. Have we talked about realism enough? Do I need to say this again? Well, here we go. Realism is by far the most common style of theater that we have in uh, America today and probably Europe too. Uh, it depicts real life, right? Daily struggle, usually local speech patterns. As I've said, you know, your piano lesson is the texture, you know, have read for this course. And it has a lot of, you know, it has the N word, but it also has a lot of slang that these people coming up from Mississippi still use and uh, people of color use at that time. And so that is typical of the realistic style. And uh, it can be a little bit of an issue for some of us trying to interpret what they're saying. I love Eugene O'Neill, but every time I watch a Eugene O'Neill uh, performance, I have to sort of decode it because I'm not from the Northeast at the turn of the century. And so the jargon that they use and the way that they talk uh, is not standard issued. Remember, we have a lot of visceral details. We can see the sweat on their brow. We can watch the steam come off of that iron. She's cooking the eggs. Presumably, we can smell them. And remember, there's not going to be a lot of direct contact between the performers and the audience. We're going to keep that illusion of the fourth wall. Uh, no asides or direct soliloquies to those in the front row in realism. So where did realism sort of begin? Here's a picture from an MTSU performance of A Doll's House that they did recently. Um, Henrik Ibsen wrote problem plays, not in the same way that Shakespeare did, but he wrote plays with um, a current issue. So Hedda Gabler, um, you know, she shoots herself at the end of the play, spoiler alert, and she... Um, is just very neurotic and he depicts the grotesqueness of that of the uh, person going crazy enemy of the people is my favorite henrik ibsen uh, and it is a doctor who knows that the water is polluted but they have this beautiful town and it's a tourist attraction so he becomes very unpopular telling everybody the truth right which is often the relationship that henrik ibsen's plays have the character versus the world right and probably his most famous one you may have read in a lit class uh, is Doll's House. And um, Nora is the doll. Her husband, and that's the picture depicted here, her husband treats her like an ornament. He, he trivializes who she is. And then very controversially, at the end of the play, she walks away from both her husband and her children. Uh, people rioted in the streets. It was... Um, very controversial at the time and it showed she you know she was in money trouble she was trying to make ends meet she was trying to um, borrow and she forged a signature and so she's not innocent in all of this but we get to see um, a real life we know what happens right we know that parents abandon their children uh, but it is a tragic ending and all of these plays once again, we talk about money, we have visceral details, we have um, hard day-to-day -day interactions that aren't clear-cut and aren't in any way romanticized or melodramatic. So, love some Henry Gibson. Hey, there's me, uh, talking about some Chekhov. And this is Chekhov light. It was a Neil Simon interpretation of Chekhov, which was fun. Uh, Neil Simon is one of the greatest playwrights uh, that America has ever known. Hilarious. Maybe you've seen The Odd Couple, um, Star Spangled Girl. He uh, wrote very funny plays. He was a New Yorker. But Anton Chekhov is also a very realistic uh, playwright. And he was the one that Stanislavski so 
liked so much. We talked about kind of this rebirth of theater, rebirth of gaining directors, actors having nuance. Chekhov was a champion for this, not in his own time, um, but when Stanislavski picked him up and started using his plays, he, he got discovered. Chekhov was a doctor, and so he had these radical beliefs about all people being the same. You know, they look the same on the inside as they do, um, no matter if they're wealthy or uh, poor. Uh, he has a very famous play called Three Sisters. Uh, w- and um, in general, we have less overt action, right? One of the things that happens, I used to assign in my acting class, uh, there's this scene where Masha uh, is flirting with this soldier and they're talking about the weather and how cold it is and they're warming themselves on the fire. And then a few scenes later, we find out they run away together. Well, that whole scene of them talking about the weather, in retrospect, in the scope of the whole play, you figure out, oh, they're flirting. They're having this secret coded conversation like you do, right, where they're talking about the weather, but you're really talking about something else. So when I say less overt action, um, I just mean that there's a lot of subtext and... um, that doesn't mean, you know, in Seagull, somebody shoots themselves on stage. It's not It's not to say that there's never overt action. But in general, a lot of what's going on is kind of like real life in that there are subtleties involved. And we don't have the same causality that we have in a lot of the more traditional melodrama. Remember we said last class that the you know perfect play, we've got this event where melodramatically they're facing each other off in the final scene. Whereas in, in Chekhov, uh, the things aren't necessarily that um, clearly linked to each other. The most innovative thing that Chekhov did was put humor and pain back to back. And we have to imagine he is a medical professional was probably more, you know, uh, had a thicker skin when it came to pain, right? Uh, He's been at many a bedside. My favorite example of this is from the great play Cherry Orchard, where a man, uh, a woman is losing her estate, the Cherry Orchard. She's uh, going bankrupt. She's horrible with money. She's a former actress uh, who's star has faded and this is a time where a lot of servants are uh, you know finding other work kind of uh, during this revolutionary time where uh, it's becoming less and less common to have servants and as the cherry orchard closes um, the the butler lays down on the stage and dies which is a very sad sort of tribute to people who make their work their life, right? Uh, but this same character has spent the whole show with squeaky shoes, and it bothers him, and it bothers the audience. He's got these squeaky shoes. And so sure enough, he's like squeaky shoeing out to, to die, right? So there's there's comedy and uh, tragedy back-to-back and, and simultaneously funny and pitiful, right? Um, so Chekhov was trying to write life as he saw it, and he also uh, wrote short stories. He also is just one of those great Russian writers at that time. Uh, you know, Dostoevsky, a lot of these guys were also uh, writing in Russia at this time. Moving over to the Americas. As I said, Eugene O'Neill, one of the greatest playwrights of our time. Long day's journey into night. Man, if you ever need a good cry, just sit down and watch Katherine Hepburn in this role. So in naturalism, we have realism on steroids, right? This is truly a slice of life. Um, truly uh, not plot driven. Truly every little nuance of everyday life it's kind of like you're watching reality tv uh, but more real obviously um no climax in long day's journey and tonight uh, i did some scene work out of this and we lovingly nicknamed it long scenes journey into nowhere because <laughs> there was no payoff for the audience uh, it was just sad and sad and then it got a little sadder that was the overall part and they really did stick to real time not just like in 24 hours, like in two and a half hours, like while you're watching the play. Eugene O'Neill wrote this play uh, about his own mother and her addiction to opioids. Uh, She was addicted to opium and she overdosed and his father was an alcoholic. And so it's basically just spending one night in his crazy household. Uh, Really brave 
move that a lot of playwrights at that time sort of dabbled in. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. Whew. So, naturalism is a extreme form of realism. Slice of life. Yay! He can fly, he can fly, he can fly. We get into stylized theater. So after the World Wars, uh, we get into this period of trying to find the words to express this unexpressible thing. You know, we're mourning uh, the death of so many people that we knew on love. We're mourning um, uh, this demise of a lot of the social constructs. You know, a lot of people are losing their religion. And so we are experimenting in stylized theater. And there's also a lot of psychotropics out there. I'm not going to lie. This stuff is heavily influenced, I think, for some writers uh, by their drugs. Not J. J. M. Barry, not Peter Pan, not kids plays. I don't think. Um, and sometimes we're speaking in allegory, right? Uh, Firebugs is a play where this is a Greek chorus on the floor here. A play where uh, this family is hosting someone. They're living in their attic, and slowly there are all these fires going on around town, and these guests living in the attic are bringing up their gasoline, bringing up their supplies, and the household is just sort of welcoming them in, even though there are fires going all around the neighborhood. And it just, you know, Frisch is a artist, and he lived through the Holocaust, and he's just sort of speaking to the absurdity of the way that uh, many Germans reacted, uh, or Austrians, I think that he's Austrian, um, many uh, people reacted to the Nazis and embraced them. And like we've already mentioned, rhinoceros, you know, the same sense of the absurdity of what happened compared to um, rational thought. Expressionism. Expressionism is nightmare. Um, It's like a dream that has uh, gone bad, and often expressionism, you can see those bars being exposed, you can see harsh lights and harsh shadows, it's because it ought to feel like a nightmare world, and um, it's a little bit like surrealism, the color palette is always really limited, Um, there's a whole genre of expressionistic film uh, that started in Germany, uh, if you're interested. Uh, But it was also reflected on the stage. This is actually a Eugene O'Neill piece, though. This is an American playwright who we mentioned earlier. And he wrote this sort of nightmarish play, just kind of playing in the genres. A lot of great uh, authors at that time kind of tried on these genres and wrote a few plays in that style. Uh, just to kind of attempt it. Harry Ape is a social commentary. They begin the scene and they're shoveling coal, and then by the end of the scene, they've turned into apes. And there's a woman who comes in, the way they treat the woman, they start sort of being more beastie, being more, um, you know, uh, pejorative towards her. And and it's uh, kind of one of those short but very impactful, kind of absurdist, uh, not absurd, absurd, expressionistic plays. Doing these plays can be very difficult. The one on the left there is uh, Kafka's Metamorphic, Mor- Metamorphosis, the Stephen Burkoff version, and memorizing my lines proved to be very challenging because there wasn't a lot of logic to the lines. And uh, it, it, you know that often as an actor you sit down to sort of memorize the scope of things or where the scene is going, but if it's a scene without clear logical um, progressions, it can be you know, like memorizing monkey and typewriter situation. Um, It also requires a different acting style. A lot of these plays have a more deadpan delivery. They don't have the same um, approach that you would for other plays. So it can be an interesting challenge, a fun challenge in some cases. Uh, And it can also um, be a way to stretch yourself, right, and try something different. We've already talked a little bit about Mother Courage and her children and epic theater. It was made famous by Bertolt Brecht. Uh, 
remember, he was interested in stimulating people's intellect rather than their emotion. So he uh, used this historification. He used these techniques. He would tell people how the plot ended before it began. Um, it is considered epic theater. It happens over right, no verisimilitude, lots and lots of places, over grand sweeping times, because he's trying to tell um, every man's story, right? Epic, as they say. Uh, really, I haven't heard of any other authors following in Bertolt Brecht's exact footsteps with epic theater, and he was himself a theorist, and he made it very clear what he expected out of an epic play. So, um, there are lots of little kind of styles of theater, and we've already kind of mentioned these. I've, this feels a little bit redundant. Um, theater of the absurd, right? We already mentioned uh, non sequiturs, talking in gibberish, things um, never having any sort of conclusion or resolution, uh, things being cruel and abrupt at times, and uh, often humor is included. You see those two. Um, Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart, those great actors attempting these roles, and they're dressed kind of like clowns or tramps, uh, because they are funny, uh, even though it's meaningless and hopeless, there are funny moments. So, something completely different. Uh, it's worth mentioning, though, that on Broadway, we have across the street a realistic Eugene O'Neill play. I mean, Long Day's Journey into Night, Iceman Cometh, these things are always running on Broadway. And then right across the street, we have Jazz Hands. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, the first musical, which this isn't in your textbook, so make sure to write this down for your assessment. Um, the first musical is Black Crook. And we had operettas before that, um, Gilbert and Sullivan. One of my favorite plays, as I've already mentioned, was Pirates of Penzance. I am the very model of a modern major general. Uh, but those operettas kind of created something new in the U.S. And um, the first sort of Broadway performance that we have that brought in a big crowd were Parisian ballerinas who took off their tights. They were telling a magical sort of story about a fairy queen, uh, but let's not pretend that it was part skin show, right? And um, it was on Broadway, and it's often considered the first Broadway play because it's a unique American form, and uh, it has a lot of the same tropes that continued up until this day. Zigfield Follies quickly followed, and it became sort of the standard American musical of that time. If you've ever seen Funny Girl, they have Zigfield's Follies in there. A lot of women often elaborately dressed, doing uh, often kind of the same sort of show that you would expect from a kick line. Everybody's kind of the same height. Everybody is relatively the same weight. They look the same. They're acting the same. And um, it was a, a huge spectacle, big costumes, big sets, uh, you know, and we would have these sort of big dance routines and then somebody would come out and sing a song. They were not a storyline. They were more kind of what we would think of as a talent show. When we get into the musical comedy. It's still part talent show. Uh, I say that one of my favorite musicals is pictured here. Anything goes. Um, they were all funny. They may have had a serious song here and there, but they were all um, patriotic, although I would argue uh, superficially so, often not in any deep meaningful way. Uh, there's usually some girl who shows up in the city for the first time and she's like, uh, you know, wide-eyed and full of dreams and she gets off the, the boat and it's sort of this um, these tropes that we know. Uh, it still had the feel... Um, of an unconnected plot, right? So we have these guys show up and they do a dance routine and then they go off stage and then this comic comes in and he does a bit and he goes off stage. It feels very disconnected. It's not motivated throughout. Um, but it's very entertaining, right? Very entertaining. So the characters are based on archetypes. You know, like I said, we have... Um, and sometimes they're racial archetypes, let's be honest. These aren't all uh, 
pretty <laughs> that way. Um, but, you know, we often have the young lovers. We have the body, uh, worldly wise woman. We have the trickster kind of guy who in this show is Billy, who's constantly getting away with things. So they're fun. They're fast paced. They're frothy. They're light. They're not really connected, but they feel a lot like a talent show. And there's lots of tap dancing. Until we come to Showboat. And the clip I gave you here is of one of my favorite songs of all time, Old Man River. Showboat was based on a novel, so we have a new sort of feel to it. Um, we know that movies or plays who are based on novels have more nuance, have more dimensional characters. Uh, I would argue that it's one of the more progressive plays that Broadway has ever seen because it depicts people of color um, as they were and with real world problems, not just... Um, Unfortunately, at this time, there was a lot of um, buffoonery on Broadway, a lot of people doing blackface, and this is a much more empathetic uh, depiction of people of color, partially because it was a lot of it was written by people who were Jewish, who were also minoritized, but they, were, they could pass, as we say in race theory. So, um, so the opening scene, right from the beginning, they're, the police show up and they're ready to arrest this woman who has married a white man who uh, it is found out that she's misogynated. She's half black. And so even from the very opening number, you get this sense of like, okay, we're in it for the struggle. It doesn't mean, you can see the jazz hands there, it doesn't mean that there aren't uh, moments of lightness, but overall the story is dep depicts a very heartfelt uh, and nuanced uh, relationship between the races. So it kind of redefined and um, it redefined what a musical could be. It redefined what audiences could expect. Perhaps the most famously Oscar Hammerstein the second who you may know from Rogers and Hammerstein, uh, you know, this really kicked off his start. It was Drone Kern uh, and Oscar and Hammerstein. It wasn't um, Rogers yet, but it was thorough. It was not just some, you know, froth, frothy romantic fable. It was a controversial issue being depicted uh, in a way that um, felt almost like an opera at times. Heavy emotions heavy emotions going on. So we get to the high point. I call it the golden age, but your book calls it the high point of musical theater, uh, responsible primarily from Rodgers and Hammerstein. Um, Sound of Music is perhaps uh, one of his most famous, their fam most famous works uh, about a young woman who falls in love with the man whose children she's taking care of. She leaves the, being a nun and they have to escape the Nazis through the mountains. Very romanticized. Musical theater has reached an unprecedented commercial success, right? We have mood boosting music. We have a little bit of conflict, but overall, once again, just a lot of um, feel-good kind of moments, family-friendly entertainment. Um, there was the beginning of touring companies that would go around the U.S. and abroad, and that really helped bolster the success of musical theater. Um, uh, a lot of the music that you would hear would get covered by different jazz musicians. So if you look at The Sound of Music, for example, there are hundreds of versions of my favorite things, right? All the greats, Billie Holiday, Frank Sinatra, all these guys are taking a stab at their version of um, of these classic Broadway shows. Christmas music, still the Christmas music that we enjoy to this day comes from White Christmas. Um, a lot of these uh, Cole Porter, you know, and <laughs> It's kind of funny to me because a lot of these composers are Jewish. They don't even celebrate Christmas, but hey, you know, pays the bills. <laughs> so, um, and you know, I love White Christmas. Nothing makes me tear up quicker than that than that kind of romantic piano jazzy style. 
Hugh Jackman, isn't he beautiful? If you've never seen his version of Oklahoma at the National, I would encourage you to go stop what you're doing right now and go watch it. He's such a good singer and dancer and such a little cutie. So, um, 1943, we have some progress through Oklahoma. Uh, it's once again, still very sentimental. Rogers and Hammerstein, good New York Jewish boys, never even went out west, but they've sentimentalized this sort of life out west and, uh, you know, enjoying Oklahoma. The way that this was really revolutionary is because we start to have plot points during the songs, during the dancing, right? So there's the whole dance of uh, this famous ballet that happens during Oklahoma where we see her dream sequence of her fears expressed and we see plot progression. And overall, this is just, once again, that picking up of pace that happens. We live currently in sort of a microwave age where everything moves really quickly. But uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein really started making sure that these songs weren't just breaks from the action, but events could happen during the songs, right? Somebody could get stabbed. Spoilers for Oklahoma, I know. Uh, it celebrates rural life, right? Once again, a little bit ironic for these New York people, but um, it uh, is very catchy and enjoyable. I'm a fan of Oklahoma. West Side Story, another one of my favorite musicals here, speaking of New York. It's based on the story of Romeo and Juliet, and... Um, it, initially, when they were creating it, they were going to do a, a Jewish boy and a Catholic girl, uh, but they decided that audiences weren't ready for that. So instead, they have uh, the um, Puerto Ricans and the Polish, and their kind of love affair between the two. I love this play. It, it's hard for me to watch it when white people go to the tanning bed and, and play Maria. I, you know, I do think it's one of those stories that really should be reserved for people of color if they're going to play the Puerto Ricans, but I understand it's beautiful music. I understand education systems wanting to expose their students to it. So some ways that West Side Story was unique because Rogers and Hammerstein always set, you know, South Pacific, exotic location. They're on an island, um, you know, West, uh, the one we just looked at, Oklahoma, it's set out in the wild, wild west. The King and I is set abroad in an Asian country. So we have uh, West Side Story is one of the first ones to depict everyday life uh, and everyday clothes. And it, that same thing of like people dancing in the streets that kind of MTV popularized, uh, West Side Story sort of has that same feel. And I would argue is the one that kind of got that going. A lot of people joke about West Side Story uh, because there's the sharks and the jets doing this stylized dance fight, uh, and it, it is sort of funny uh, at times to look back at that choreography and see sort of kind of hokey it can be, um, but the musical is just beautiful and so moving and um, speaks to the darkness uh, that happens in the urban streets and how... Um, you know, even though it's still told through a stylized, it's wrestling with some very real issues. There's hairspray. Gotta love hairspray. So when rock and roll rose in popularity and it became more socially acceptable for people to go to these concert venues, remember in the 1950s and 1940s, a lot of jazz and blues happened in clubs for people of color. So white people didn't feel comfortable going into those situations. We lived in a very segregated society. But rock and roll and started being played on the radio and it really sort of changed um, the dynamics for public consumption of, of entertainment, right? So we've had the civil rights movement and people can now go to concert venues together. And that really hurt um, musical theater as a genre because musical theater used to be what you did on a Friday night or, you know, what was played on the radio um, for, for middle-class people, for wealthy people. Um, so a lot of what happened to musical theater is it became revivals, especially in New York City. New York City in the 70s was a really rough neighborhood. Broadway, the theater district had a lot of skin shows. It was really uh, not for family friendly environment. 
and there I am in hair. Hair is a good example of how the stage tried to adapt to the rock and roll mindset, and uh, hair doesn't really have a plot, and it was an anti-war play, and it had drug use on stage, nudity, a lot of sexuality, um, and it was a way of depicting uh, what was really going on in the 60s. It was funny, when I did this show, we had a lot of, we performed near a military base, and, and people from the military would come. A lot of them uh, didn't like unnecessary wars either, so it was interesting. Um, this is the song, let the sun shine, let the sun shine in, the sun shine in. Uh, very famous song you probably heard. Um, a few of the songs from Hair, and maybe you didn't know that they were from Hair. Um, Age of Aquarius, Age of Aquarius. Yeah, maybe. So, um, Hair was the exception, though. A lot of uh, musical theater was not popular. It was considered out of vogue. It was not very innovative, and so it was dying. Until we get to the 80s and we have a new kind of theater coming out with Stephen Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim took what people expected to go to the theater and see jazz hands and happy people holding hands. They get to the theater and it's poetic and wrestling with human emotion and the disappointment with urban life. Uh, he often has something sadistic in his comedy, cynical tones. Maybe you've heard of Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, slitting people's throats. Um, Into the Woods takes this fairy tale genre that we expect and deals instead with what happens after Cinderella gets married and she has married this man who was only meant to be charming and now she has to try to make a life with them. Um, at the midpoint of Into the Woods at the intermission, we come back from intermission and like half the cast has died. Stephen Sondheim as a, a uh, gay man in the AIDS crisis, he's very much dealing with what do you do when like half the people you know and love are suddenly dead. And there are these beautiful songs about um, sometimes people leave you halfway through the woods and you decide what's good kind of dealing with the disappointment of death and how do you keep going when you feel like you can't go on um, my favorite musicals Sweeney Todd into the woods are our Stephen Sondheim. My mom doesn't like him because my mom likes dance. She likes to go to the theater. She wants to see something like West Side Story, Oklahoma, where people are dancing. Although I will say the newest version of Oklahoma, the one I saw in the Toadies, didn't seem to have much dancing in it, which I thought was an odd choice. But that's part of the, the lively theater is it's always got to grow and change and surprise audiences or it will die. Because if you, if they've already been there, done that, they don't want to see that anymore. So there's this relationship now between movies and the stage. Most recently we saw a trailer for Cats that was so disturbing. I love Cats. I grew up uh, watching the movie version and I went to TPAC. It's one of the first experiences I had in a theater where I was completely mystified, fell in love with these characters. And I do not know what that director is doing. But um, we often, if we're going to spend that much money on a ticket, we want to know it's a safe bet. So movies like Hairspray, like Cry, Cry Baby, where we watch the movie first, so we think we'll probably like the stage play. And there's only a few differences between the stage play and the movie. Audiences tend to gravitate towards that. So I would say that's one of the new trends that we have on the Broadway. So we had this sort of lack of success you know Sondheim has a foothold with Fifth Avenue people he has a foothold with um, musical theater lovers and intellectuals but the common group the majority of Americans are not really that interested in a musical until Andrew Lloyd Webber and the British Invasion 
So Andrew Lloyd Webber brings all of these larger-than-life spectacles, like Cats, like Phantom of the Opera. We get to see uh, a huge helicopter land in Miss Saigon, and we have these huge tours that come from London, that come from the West End, and travel throughout the United States. And people know that if they see an Andrew Lloyd Webber play, they're going to see this huge rock opera, larger-than-life spectacle. And Les Miserables is not actually by Andrew Lloyd Webber, but it was one of those British invasion pieces and um, Jesus Christ Superstar is another Andrew Lloyd Webber. We've already kind of talked about Les Mis. I won't belabor that. It had that turntable, which I already are already spoke about. Uh, do you hear the people sing, singing the song of angry men? And they're all marching on the turntable. Huge spectacle. And um, once again, Hugh Jackman, can you beat him? And if you haven't seen The Greatest Showman and you're a musical theater fan, I'm disappointed in you. It's phenomenal. He is fantastic. Now for something completely different, Book of Mormon. Um, I kind of threw this one in just to show you that there's a whole niche market of musical theater that you may not know about. Um, if you are a fan of South Park, then Book of Mormon might be for you. It's very offensive. <laughs> Uh, it's making fun of religion, and if you um, are any way sensitive to that, definitely don't see it. I think of myself as kind of a person who's a comic, and I'll laugh at anything, but whew, there were some times in Book of Mormon that I was like, ah, that's not funny. Uh, so Frozen, um, you know, the children's movie uh, was written by Robert Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez, and... Um, they uh, also worked on Book of Mormon, Robert Lopez did. And, you know, these musicals, I think my love of musicals were really born with Disney movies, you know, Little Mermaid, Lion King, uh, it's all the same composers, it's all the same choreography of a traditional musical, and it was definitely um, hard to overestimate its importance. And it also speaks to what's playing today on Broadway are still those Disney's and uh, Universal Studios. Those those shows are still very important um, and bringing in lots of the dollars on Broadway. <laughs> um, it's very offensive, uh, but I was encouraged when I went to go see it. There were uh, Latter-day Saint missionaries in the lobby, so they were willing to laugh at themselves. They were willing to use this as opportunity to have their religion understood. Hamilton. I could not talk about Hamilton. Um, Moana is one of my favorite of all time musicals, uh, cartoon musicals, and that's composed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Uh, if you haven't heard about Hamilton, I don't know where you've been because it feels like it is everywhere. It's a hip-hop musical, uh, and it uses non-traditional casting to sort of help uh, audiences understand the multicultural nature of, of early United States. It's a fresh look at it. He was on vacation reading a novel about Alexander Hamilton and was just inspired by that. It has become sort of a mark of, of wealth to have somebody who can afford a $400 Hamilton ticket, um, you know, and nothing draws a crowd like a crowd because it's a you know, hard to get tickets. I think a lot of people want to see it because it's hard to get tickets. It's sort of a look what I can do kind of thing. I don't mean to sound so jaded. It's a beautiful piece of art. It celebrates America, which is something that I think audiences really needed when it hit at that moment. Um, Lin-Manuel Miranda got to perform songs of Hamilton in front of Obama. Uh, it's become very meaningful to a lot of people. When I meet hardcore musical theater fans and, um, you know, Hamilton is really what um, they're in into right now and what what they're enjoying and there's some really interesting initiatives that Lin-Manuel Miranda has taken about one of them is Hamiltoons which is saying that you can have sort of karaoke versions of Hamilton in local theaters and do it for free which is really exciting for audiences to have um, access to it without charge that's definitely not how most musical theater operates musical theater has traditionally been a money-making business but uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda coming from uh, lower class and raising up to um, his current you know status financially I think he understands the power of this music and the hip-hop community especially to empower young minds so 
your textbook does not nearly put the emphasis on musicals that I do. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with me. I think that a lot of you, when you go to see your live production critique, as you probably already have gone to see your live production, um, musical theater is very successful commercial theater, and it is uniquely American. Part of the reason that I love it, Hamilton is because it goes back to the original roots of when musical theater was born. You know, we have Jewish composers, we have African American tap dancing uh, and, and blues influences and Irish clogging and all of this immigrant surplus that we had at the turn of the century comes together in this wonderful melting pot of people trying to make money in vaudeville bars. And, uh, you know, we had a huge vaudeville scene here in Nashville. And to see that uh, was also reflected in New York City. And um, they were just trying to make a buck. And they all came together and melded their art forms and created something new and different and exciting um, through their talent, through their resourcefulness, um, and huge immigrant population creating that first musical theater. So it's exciting for me to see that sort of reflected in Hamilton and how we're kind of doing a mashup. And that, to me, is more American than anything you can do. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this class. I know sometimes when you sit down to take a survey course, it can feel like random definitions and kind of putting things together. But I hope it's helped teach you how to think and analyze information. Um, I hope it's encouraged you to uh, embrace your your spirit and feed your soul with art and uh, opened your eyes to something new and different that maybe you wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. And for the last time, thank you for listening. <laughs>